like to invite you to open your Bibles this morning to Psalm 37. Psalm 37, uh, as I shared in our Sunday school class, I just felt very much drawn to this passage this past week. And I felt like this is the message God has for us, His people, at this particular time in history. I think there is a certain relevance in light of present events that this passage speaks to us. Thoughts from this passage, this land is your land. You all know the folk song, I thought about singing it and then I thought otherwise. <laughs> This land is your land. This land is my land. This land was made for you and me. You know, why is it when early in the week you get a song in your head and it just won't get out of your head? So might just as well have been singing it because it's been in my head all week. But I, I just saw the thoughts out of this 37th Psalm having much to do with land. And we're going to zero in on that in a little bit. But the psalmist has a lot to say about land. And we want to take a look at not only what he says but why that mention of land is important to us. Verses 1 and 2. Do not fret because of evildoers. Be not envious toward wrongdoers, for they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Don't fret and don't be envious. Two things that are easy enough to understand, but very challenging to practice. Do not fret over evil doers. On the other hand, don't be envious of the wrongdoers who are prospering in their wrongdoing. It's so very, very easy to do both of those things. I thought about the fretting over evil doers, and I thought that had some special significance in the times that we're in right now. Earlier this week, I was not sure if this country would be at war by today or not. And I guess you probably all know there's not been a declaration of war, and uh, no hostilities have, have been initiated by this country, but it sounds like it could happen relatively soon in the Middle East. And so the idea of war certainly is kind of scary to all of us as peace-loving people. But we realize that if that happens, it's because of an evildoer, some evil-doing people in a, in a Middle Eastern country that have unleashed chemical weapons against their people. And that's one of those abhorrent things that scares us to death because if it can be done there, it could be done here. And it's awful easy to fixate on that and fret over evildoers such as that. So I think that perhaps fretting over evildoers kind of speaks with significance in the times that we're living in right now. And perhaps because of that, the message of Psalm 37, I think is a tremendously reassuring message. I found a lot of peace and comfort and reassurance from it as well. Because overall, as you look at the verses in this psalm, it overall reminds us that to God's people that God always reigns. And, and that the prosperity and the schemes of wicked people will not, cannot last. And so the message overall in this psalm as we look at it today is that the psalmist appeals under inspiration of God to his people in every time and place to be calmly patient and to look forward always in hope. That is a timeless message. But again, I think it has a great deal of relevance to our situation in the world today. Again, he says, do not fret because of evildoers. In fact, do not fret is mentioned three different times. Whenever God mentions something three times, he wants us to know it is settled and we ought to pay attention to it. And so here is a very relevant truth for us. Do not fret, which in the original language means don't become heated. Don't get yourself worked up in a lather over what's going on around you that is wrong, that is evil. Again, there is nothing easier to do. Be reminded of the big picture. Step back away from what you see, whether it's aggression, whether it's mistreatment of people by an evil dictator in the Middle East or, or unfair things in our society. Step back from the scene a little bit and realize whatever people are getting away with in an evil sense, it is short term. I know it's in the now, so it seems big, but it won't last. It cannot last. And so we step back and say, God is still in charge, and God has a specific plan that is very much on target, as it always has been, and let's make sure 
that we don't miss out on that. Do not fret and do not be envious of evildoers. Verses 3 to 6, the psalmist says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land. Here's the first mention of the land that we're going to see quite a bit here. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, Yahweh, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord and trust also in Him and He will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Trust in your God. Easy enough to say that. But how do you really do that? How do you really, truly trust with all of your heart, leaning not on your own understanding, trusting fully in Yahweh God? Trust doesn't come easy. Trust is very challenging. I think of the irony of American currency. It has that phrase you're all so familiar with, in God we trust. The irony is, do we trust in the God it speaks about or do we trust in the currency that it's written on? It's a whole lot easier to trust in the currency rather than to trust in the God that we know, our Father. Trust, I believe, means that we totally lean on. Thinking about this little sort of flimsy podium. I've heard Joe talk about, I don't think I want to lean on that thing because it just looks like it might fall. It looks like it might break, and indeed it might. If I really trusted, as this is being a trustworthy object, I could lean into it with all my strength and all my weight and be assured that I'd be all right. It wasn't going to fall over, but I can't do that. It's not that trustworthy of an object. That which we call upon for trust, namely our God, we have to be convinced, first of all, that He's worthy of leaning in totally upon. And again, we can say that. We can talk about that in church. But really, totally trusting upon God is not so easily done. Again, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. We're all intelligent and clever enough to think that we can lean somewhat on our own understanding. I think I'm resourceful enough. I can trust somewhat in the way I think and what I do. And yet I realize that's dangerous. Because I'm called upon not to trust a little bit in God and trust the rest in myself. I'm called upon to trust in the Lord with all my heart, with all of my being. And the psalmist talks about what it looks like if we trust. If we trust in the Lord, we do good. Yeah, we're do-gooders. Isn't that the accusation raised of Christians and churchgoers? Yeah, a bunch of do-gooders. Okay, we are. We trust in the Lord and we are willing to do that which is good and pleasing to Him and to forego the ways of others and say, it matters that I do this because my God is a trustworthy being and I can forego those things the rest of the world is all about and lean in totally upon Him because I believe He's worth it and worthy of it. So I do good if I trust in the Lord. It also says if I trust in Him, I delight in Yahweh God. There was some discussion in our adult Sunday school class about delighting in Him. That's kind of a foreign concept and word to us. What does it mean to literally delight in my Father Creator? And that's something we all got to flesh out and figure out ourselves. But what does it literally mean to delight in Him? Not just to like Him a little bit, be familiar with Him generally, but to delight in Him. The psalmist calls upon us to do that, to delight in Him. We are called upon to dwell in the land and to cultivate faithfulness. If I lean in on God, that's another thing that I do. I dwell in His territory. What is the territory God has given me? What has He given us? What is that land that I dwell in? And the faithfulness that I cultivate, I stay in the good land. And I remain resolute in what God has said and promised. I do good faithfully as I dwell in the land, as I delight in Him. I commit my way to Him. I commit my direction to Him. I realize that He's the trustworthy guide, not myself. And so the pathway that He would lay out for me and for you to say, I will go in that direction because it will work a lot better than my own direction will work. 
I often think about a man I knew several years ago that was challenged with a question as he was kind of in midlife and going about doing things uh, that he thought he ought to do in his life. Somebody challenged him with a question, have you ever prayed about what you ought to do with your life? And I've heard him give the testimony that he said that stopped him in his tracks. He realized he'd never really prayed about what to do in life. He just did what seemed like the best thing to do. And so he stopped and he prayed. And as he did so, over time he realized God had a different direction for his life than what he had chosen. And so he prayed and he went another direction. And that direction allowed him to touch lives and impact people for ministry and service. And he was a blessing to others. And I think it comes down to us as well. If we trust in God, do we just make decisions and say, this seems like the best thing to do? Or, or do we stop and say, God, I want this life to be surrendered wholly to you. And so therefore, I want to know, no matter how challenging it might be, I want to know the pathway you have for my life. That maybe it involves pulling up stakes and moving to a distant place. Maybe it involves doing something I'm not at all comfortable doing right where I am, but what is it, God, you want for me to do? If I trust in the Lord, I'm willing to seek His direction and to follow it when it's impressed upon me and say, God, that seems hard or that doesn't seem to make sense or whatever. God, that's what I want because I know that's what you want. That's what trust looks like in our lives if we lean in on our God. Verse 7. The psalmist says, Rest in in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret. There's the second time that phrase is there. Do not fret because of Him who prospers in His way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. There's that same theme to be repeated again. Don't worry about the evildoer and don't be envious of the person that prospers in doing evil. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently on Him. That's also what trust will look like. Rest in the Lord. That's kind of an interesting phrase. Don't go to sleep on me here. That's not what that means. Rest in the Lord means something much different. In fact, at Wednesday nights, we've been studying the book of Hebrews. And there is mention in the book of Hebrews of the believer's rest. An interesting phrase. I've read that a lot of times over the years. I, I didn't exactly know what that meant, but there's some interesting things there in terms of the believer's rest. You know, God made everything that exists six days and He rested on the seventh day. It's easy to say, God must have really been worn out. He needed to take a break. No, God did not need to rest. There's no limit to His energy. But God set a precedent. God rested saying, this is good for my creation. This is good for my people to work and then take a break. Take time out to review. Take time out to be rejuvenated. And so He gave us an example of that. And there is an ultimate rest that we have in Jesus Christ, as the book of Hebrews talks about. Because without knowing Christ, we are busy about trying to please our Father, and there's no end to trying to please Him because it cannot be done. Christ, once and for all, has offered His life as a sacrifice. He is seated at the right hand of God, actively interceding for His people. And as such... We can enter into a rest and say, it's all right between myself and the Father. And I don't have to be busy about the works that would earn His favor that never will anyway. I enjoy a peace and a serenity as I rest in my Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. That comes of trust as well. If I trust God enough to believe that the price is paid through His Son then I don't have to work feverishly to earn His favor. I relax and I rest in that favor. I bask in that rest. And we do that if we trust in the Lord Yahweh. I rest in Him and I wait patiently as I rest. It is so humanly easy to say, I've got to do something about this or that. There is an injustice, I've got to roll up my sleeves, and I've got to work hard to set straight. And maybe God directs us in certain activities along those lines, but by and large, if we are trusting in Him in, in difficult times and circumstances especially, we rest and we wait patiently, and we know again as we step back in the big picture, whatever's going on right now that's evil, it cannot last. His plan and His will will indeed prevail. Rest and wait patiently for God. But is there anything harder to do than that? To be impatient and say, God, could you please hurry it up just a little bit? You seem a little bit slow. 
And I often think that. I'm reminded in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness. I'm one of those that easily counts slowness that way. It's been a huge amount of time, God. Why has it not come to a conclusion yet? Why haven't you sent your son back? Why are we not living in the kingdom age now? It sure seems, according to my timetable, you're slow, and it ought to be on task. If we trust in God, we trust his timetable, we trust it enough to rest and to wait patiently, and again, not to get heated, not to work ourselves into a lather. We wait patiently for him. Verse 8. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. There's the third time. Do not fret. It leads only to evil doing. Again, trusting in God, waiting patiently upon our Father, keeps us away from getting angry and getting involved in wrath because those things very easily come when we get impatient. When we look at our timetable and see it's different than His and say, come on God, hurry it up, things ought to be happening a lot faster. I relate especially to verse 8 because I easily get angry. I easily can become wrathful. And uh, I don't want to excuse myself, but it comes a little bit more easily to someone like me maybe than in others because I'm a firstborn of a firstborn. And uh, we want things a certain way in a certain time. And if it doesn't happen that way, we get worked up into a lather. We get heated. So I'm easily prone to that. So I take these words very seriously when it says, this is what I do if I trust in God. Not only as a firstborn of a firstborn, I'm thinking of my impressionable teen years. There was that thing about the coming of Christ at any moment, the 70s. You all remember the 70s? A lot of talk, uh, a lot of songs, a lot of movies about the return of Christ at any moment, thief in the night, all that kind of stuff. And so I figured surely by the 80s, maybe the 90s, at the least Christ would have come back, and here we are beyond that. Wow. In fact, I was thinking about that second coming frenzy of uh, earlier years, and I think I still have the booklet somewhere entitled, Ten Reasons Why Jesus Must Return Before 1968. <laughs> Might be kind of fun to get that out again. And then I think about an article that was entitled, Will Jesus Return in the 1980s? No. <laughs> At that time, though, there was some speculation, some interesting things, the challenges concerning will he be coming back soon. But again, thinking about all that and those expectations, it's easy to become angry. It's easy to become wrathful even over being impatient. God, hurry it up. We want your plan moving along a little faster. Verse 9, for evildoers again will be cut off. But those who wait for the Lord, notice they will inherit the land. We've been touching on that land theme a bit here, and now we zero right in. There's a lot of mention of land in the 37th Psalm. Dwell in the land, verse 3 that we just looked at. Verse 9, inherit the land, verse 9. The humble will inherit the land, verse 11. The righteous will inherit the land, verse 29. He will exalt you to inherit the land, verse 34. Do you get the message? There's something about land that God has for His people. And so the question that begs to be asked is, what is the land? And as I look at the psalmist mentioning land, he seems to talk about two different things. There is some present land, and there is something future in terms of land. And that fits exactly with what I understand of the land promise of the kingdom of God. There is the now and there is the not yet. I believe there is some sense of the kingdom of God right here and now, but it is not in its fullness until Christ comes. So there is the land that will come in the future, but there is a certain amount of land and territory for the people of God to dwell in, as the psalmist says, to live in now as we await some land which is to come. I'm reminded of a promise in 2 Chronicles 7:14, If my people who are called by my name will do these things, humble themselves, secondly, and pray, and thirdly, seek my face, fourthly, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and notice, will heal their land. And often we take that to mean the, the country, the nation that we live in, but perhaps that's not accurate. There is territory, there is land where the people of God live, and if they will do certain things, God will pour out certain blessings. Again, there is land, there is territory that the people of God have today. And wherever it is that we live, that is part of that territory or land. The activities that we're involved in, our family, 
uh, our work, our service, our ministry, our church. There's a lot of things that can go into the present day land, that which we have a certain responsibility over as we're supposed to live in that land. First Chronicles 4 verse 10 a prayer of a man by the name of Jabez. There was a popular book a few years ago that was written off of this verse. Now Jabez called on the God of Israel saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my border or territory or land and that your hand might be with me and that you would keep me from harm that it might not pain me and God granted him what he requested. Here was a man concerned about the land and the territory and I don't know exactly what all it was he was talking about as he prayed to God but that area where he lived perhaps literally the house that he lived in, the real estate that he owned, who knows but, but that which he was about for the Lord he wanted to be blessed and to have that enlarged it's not a bad thing to say, God, enlarge my territory of service and, and, and my activity for you. So there is present day land, but certainly there is future land to be inherited because the psalmist talks about they will inherit the land. And when I read that, that's the long view picture of the coming kingdom of God. In fact, verse 11, the humble will inherit the land. Sounds an awful lot like Matthew 5, 5, the beatitude of Jesus, the meek will inherit the earth. I wonder if he didn't write off of Psalm 37 when he wrote that. The meek are going to inherit the earth. As the people of God then, there is land now, there is territory now, as we await the land which is to come. We believe we get the earth in the end, don't we? And so we live in our territory and our land right now as we look forward to the territory of a renewed earth at the return of Christ. We look forward to that. But in the midst of that, we know there are evildoers who are about trying to seize the land and misuse the land. It's all about land. In fact, somebody said every single war that has ever been fought is all about the land. Who gets the land? Why do you think there's posturing in the Middle East that causes us concern and raises our gas prices? It's because of land. Who gets the land? What's happening in Israel and Palestine? Who belongs to the land? Whose is it really? And so it's all about the land. World War I and II, all about we want more land. And so the posturing that goes on trying to get the land, and I kind of step back as I read the psalmist words and say, yeah, guess what? We all get it in the end and we never had to pick up a gun or, or buy a tank or any of those things. We get the land in the end. And so we wait patiently for the Lord as we see all that kind of posturing going on around us and say, we know that ultimately we get the land. So we go back to the message of Psalm 37. And we don't fret over those that seize and mis misuse the land and the territory now. We do the right thing as we live and dwell in our land right now as we look forward to the coming kingdom of God and getting all the land in the age that comes. And so while we look out in the Middle East and see increasing tension, as we look at problems in this land and country and all those things that might tend to trouble us, we are reminded about the inevitable outcome. And in the midst of it, we talk about our own land and territory. What is the land, God, you've given for me to dwell in right now and to cultivate faithfulness in? That is my priorities, to be faithful in the land right now. Again, whatever God has entrusted to us, that is our land. We possess that. We are faithful with that. We don't fret over what goes on with others and the rest of the land. We're reminded again that God inevitably brings the victory when it's all said and done. As one writer says that when we fret, are anxious or worry, we cause ourselves emotional strain. And we begin the process of wearing away spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically. In such a state, we greatly hinder our ability to take or inherit the land that God has for us. This writer says that in Numbers 13 and 14, Israel spent too much time fretting over the giants and their small stature instead of God's power and ability to enable them to enter the land and experience victory over its inhabitants. How frequently, this writer says, do we do the same? We look at the circumstances coming against us instead of God's power to overcome them. We fret, am I going to make it? What am I going to do? We are admonished in Scripture, do not fear for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. 
So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to us? God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. In Matthew 6, verses 25 to 34, no less than five times, Jesus admonishes us not to worry or to be anxious. But it's so easy to do, to fret and to be anxious. Once again, no matter what the circumstances are, the call remains the same. Dwell in the land. Do not let fretting and evil keep you from it. Keep trusting in the Lord. Actively do good. Cultivate faithfulness. Keep delighting yourself in the Lord. Commit your way to Him. Rest in Him and wait patiently upon Him. One verse I have omitted out of Psalm 37 that would be wrong to overlook is verse 25. The psalmist apparently is an old man. And he says in verse 25, I have been young and now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging bread. That really helps trusting in the Lord, doesn't it? The perspective of an elderly man. I used to be young. I'm old now. I look back over the vantage point of my life and this much I've seen. God takes care of his people. So don't worry and don't fret because God will do what he says he will do. Verse 39, the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. May we be encouraged by those words.